just taking men, I said to myself, this looks good to me. I'll be where the action is. I'll have to keep my eyes open. Soon he asked for a transfer to Berlin. But in Berlin, he was not at the center of action, far from it. His job was that of filing clerk, investigating Freemasons and other Nazi enemies. My first assignment had been extremely dull, sorting a huge card index of Jews, Freemasons, members of various secret societies, and other subversive elements in the Reich. Among the enemies that Eichmann had to deal with, the Jews headed the list. Maybe here was an opportunity for promotion. When the Jewish section was set up, they looked for people. I showed interest, but I was never anti-Semitic. I have Jewish relatives. Jews had lived in Germany for over a thousand years. They'd fought for Germany in the war and had played a major part in rebuilding Germany after 1920. Though they represented less than 1% of the population, the Nazis showed the Jew as the supreme enemy, more vicious and despicable than even the communists. In 1935, the first of the Nuremberg Laws made up a legal basis for persecuting the Jews. They're deprived of the vote and made second-class citizens. Marriages between Jews and Gentiles are forbidden. Later, Jews are excluded from economic activities and universities and subject to racial humiliation. Against this background, Eichmann's new job soon consisted of exclusively investigating Jews and Judaism. My main job was to read professional periodicals. Huge piles of paper were put in front of me, and I got mad when I couldn't read the Jewish papers. That is why one day I went to a bookstore and bought a book to study Hebrew. By chance, he'd landed on the one area where there were few experts, but which would assume gigantic importance in the coming years. Eichmann's observations had only one purpose, to provide raw data for future actions against the Jews. Gradually, he became the Nazi Jewish specialist, and even attracted the attention of Heydrich, the head of the Reich security services. My chief, General Heydrich, encouraged me to study and even acquaint myself with its theological aspects. I must confess, I did not greet this assignment with the apathy of an ox. I was fascinated by it. In his enthusiasm to study Jews, Eichmann often invited Jewish leaders to his office. But inquiring about Jews and Judaism had an official purpose, as he proudly told Willem Sassen in Argentina. This centered on finding out whether a person was a Gentile or a Jew turned out to be a Jew, we were the authority that deprived him of his German citizenship and property, and ultimately declared him an enemy of the state. The purpose, to force Jews to leave Germany of their own free will. His searches reached into every corner, and in his prison memoirs, he disclosed a well-kept secret which he hadn't revealed before. My experience in this field was often of a confidential and embarrassing nature. 
That's when I established that the Fuhrer's diet cook, who became his mistress, was 132nd Jewish. The diet cook was named Ava Braun, the discovery dynamite. Reinhard Heydrich, head of security, suppressed all documents relating to the matter. The origin of Hitler's mistress later became one of the best kept secrets of the Reich. In 1935, Eichmann was 29. He had a promising job, a good livelihood. Now it was time to found a family. Finally, he found a girl from the Sudetenland called Vera Liebel. Like every SS officer, he had had to submit his future wife's baptismal certificate and proof of her racial purity for the approval of his superiors. Without such proof, the marriage would be disallowed. This is Eichmann's personal SS file, and it contains all the documents relating to his marriage. What can clearly be seen here is the final OK of Eichmann's superior. Although Eichmann got married in church, there was no room in his life for Christianity. Like many of the anti-religious SS, Eichmann had left the church and belittled his wife's Catholic devotion. I once tore my wife's Bible into pieces and threw it away. Then she took a second Bible and again I tore it into pieces. Now my wife is reading from two pieces and I'm letting her go on. I do everything for my wife, as I do everything for Germany. National Socialism was his new religion, and Hitler is Messiah and Savior. In 1936, Hitler appointed Himmler head of the entire German police, while still remaining chief of the SS and Eichmann's boss. Together with Heydrich, head of the security, Himmler started building a major organization for intelligence gathering, intimidation, police work, and brutal arrests. One can only imagine the scene in those dark years, people huddled together, whispering between prayers, wondering where destiny was leading them not knowing their names were already marked on Eichmann's lists. After depriving the Jews of their civil and economic rights, the Nazis now turned to expulsion. The Middle East was one area for Jewish resettlement. While investigating these possibilities, the opportunity arose for Eichmann to visit Palestine in 1937. These newly discovered files on Eichmann, secretly held by the Stasi in East Germany, bear witness to Eichmann's work. They discuss the sending of German spies to Palestine and Eichmann's involvement with Zionist emigration bodies. A Jewish public figure came from Palestine, and I was given the job of taking care of him. We dined and talked at the Traub restaurant near the zoo. I was interested in Zionist life in Palestine. At the end of our meeting, my guest invited me to meet him in Palestine. Eichmann was ordered to accept the invitation and travelled under the cover of the editor of a Berlin newspaper. He boarded a boat at Hamburg and after a leisurely voyage and several stops along the Mediterranean, arrived in the Holy Land. Since the late 1880s, Jews had been pouring into Palestine to rebuild the land. When Eichmann visited in 1937, the Zionist enterprise had taken fierce roots in the country. 
Suspected by the British authorities of being a spy, Eichmann only stayed six hours in Haifa. From a professional point of view, I must admit my mission to the Middle East was a failure. However, I was greatly enriched personally by what I saw. I saw enough to be very impressed by what the Jewish colonists were building up. I admired their desperate will to live. The more so, since I myself was an idealist. Police Inspector Mickey Goldman interrogated Eichmann in prison. אייכמן תכשיט הידית הגדול ביותר של העם הערבי. פלסטין had allowed Eichmann to spread his wings. Now he found himself at another turning point in November 1937, when he was moved up to Untersturmführer, the equivalent of lieutenant. Three years before, he'd been a nobody. Now he was an officer, a member of the prestigious but ominous SS Führer Corps. When Hitler marched into and annexed Austria on March the 13th, 1938, he and his troops were greeted by many as sent from heaven. באתי הביתה, ואז הם שמעו את היטלר שצורר שם, ושההורים היו לגמרי מפורקים, ואומרים, הנה זה הסוף. היטלר בא, יש אנשלוס. באו ה-SA באמצע הלילה והוציאו אותנו מהמיטה, אנחנו פתחנו, אבא פתח וכבר סירת לחי. רקי גיודה, יודן גזינדו, שוויינר, ואחר כך הם ירדו לגראז' ושם עמד אוטו, וכמובן מיד לקחו את האוטו. Beyond degradation, Nazi policy towards the Jews of Austria was to strip them of their personal possessions and force them to emigrate. The policy was new, the end of the testing ground. Austria was to be Judenfrei, Jew-free. And the policy director, Eichmann. Eichmann had left Austria six years ago, unsuccessful and untried. Now he was back as an officer of the Reich to deal with the Jews. Vienna was to be the breakthrough for Eichmann. Here was the chance to prove himself as an efficient, creative and independent administrator. I found Jewish life in Austria completely disorganized. Most Jewish organizations had already been closed down by the police and their leaders put under arrest. I called in the local Jewish leaders and established a main office for Jewish immigration. It was located in the Rothschild Palace in the Prince Eugene Strasse. The purpose of Eichmann's new department was clear from its name, the Central Office for Jewish Emigration. Here, he built the Eichmann system, his smooth, efficient emigration assembly line. You put in a Jew at one end, 
and as he passes through the building he's stripped of everything so that when he comes out he has no house and no money and only a passport and a visa to leave immediately. When it suited him, Eichmann would manipulate the Jewish organizations and the Jews themselves to achieve his ends. Teddy Kollek was a Zionist envoy to Vienna. He met Eichmann to plead that 10,000 Jewish youngsters be allowed to leave Austria. Who be Eichmann granted the visas. By manipulating Kolek to his own ends, he deported another 10,000 Jews from the Reich. The files on Eichmann, formerly held by the Stasi, still bear witness to Eichmann's work. 100,000 Jews, over a half of Austria's Jewish population, were forced into exile. 500 Jews committed suicide. Throughout the country, 700 towns were soon flying a white flag, message to the world that they were Jew-free. As a result of his actions, Eichmann was recommended for promotion. In September 1938, he became Obersturmführer, or First Lieutenant. While forced emigration continued in Austria, the situation worsened for the Jews of Germany. State-supported terrorism was shamelessly used to stimulate expulsion. On the evening of November the 10th, Crystal Night, Goebbels called out his brown shirts against the Jews. In Germany and Austria, over 200 synagogues were destroyed, 7,000 shops looted, and 30,000 Jewish males sent to the concentration camps. On the 30th of January 1939, Hitler hinted that expulsion might not be the ultimate act of tyranny. Ich will heute wieder ein Prophet sein. Wenn es dem internationalen Finanzjudentum in und außerhalb Europas gelingen sollte, die Folge noch einmal in einen Weltkrieg zu stürzen, dann wird das Ergebnis nicht die deutsche Regierung der Erde und damit das Sieg des Judentums sein, sondern die Vernichtung der jüdischen Rasse in Europa. This was the first time the murder of Jews as a state policy was publicly mentioned. In his prison cell, Eichmann claimed he did not take the speech seriously. In my opinion, on the 30th of January, 1939, there was not a single person in all Germany who seriously thought about physical extermination of the Jews. We subordinates in the SD central office believe that Hitler's speech was meant purely for propaganda. Faced with Hitler's threats, the European powers followed a policy of appeasement. After Austria, Hitler demanded and was awarded the German-speaking area of Czechoslovakia. Seeing the success of the Viennese Center, Eichmann was ordered to set up a similar office in Prague. As in Vienna, it would be dedicated to expropriation and expulsion. The Treasury Ministry in central Prague became the Gestapo headquarters. And it was from here for six years that Eichmann would lead the battle against the Jews. At first, Eichmann was not happy about leaving Vienna. 
The big Viennese office was running smoothly and efficiently. Prague was a much smaller operation, almost a step backwards. Jewish leaders were sent to Vienna to learn the Eichmann system. Soon everything was working in top gear and Eichmann began to see Prague in a new light. In his memoirs, Eichmann would look back on Czechoslovakia and Prague with romantic nostalgia. For him, Prague was the golden city on the Moldova, worthy of being his second home. The bridges would be remembered, the sparkle of the water, the ancient courtyards and the feel of 500 years of history in the sleepy streets and winding alleys. But Eichmann came with a mission, to deport Jews. He quickly applied the assembly line system that had proved so successful in Vienna. 25,000 Jews emigrated from Prague between March and August 1939. As in Vienna, Eichmann used the Jewish leaders to obtain his goals and at the same time seize their property. One of them was Solomon Kramer. For years, Hitler had been preparing for war. Now his sights were on Poland. Eichmann remembered the moment well. On the 1st of September 1939, German divisions began to cross over into Poland. Our air squadrons bombed forward Polish positions. Suddenly, unthinkably, the world was at war. Now, a new word was heard. Blitzkrieg, a lightning war that would quickly roll over Germany's neighbor in the east. While most of Poland wept, the invading troops were also received with enthusiasm in some of the German-speaking areas of the country. But for the Jews, the darkest of nightmares was about to begin, and Eichmann would be the messenger of death. By the late 30s, there were over two million Jews in Poland. Many lived in the shtetl, the market towns, others in cities like Warsaw and Lodz. The Nazis saw both Jews and Poles as untermenschen, as subhuman. forces entered Krakow, the ancient capital of Poland, it contained 60,000 Jews, a quarter of the population of the city.
The terror actions started immediately with robbings, brutalization and murder. The path was set for the future. I once arrived at one of the railway stations in the east, and I saw a soldier from the Waffen-SS burn the beard of an Orthodox Jew with a lighter. Although it was none of my business, I reported him immediately to his commander and asked for his punishment. Actions could be performed in distant Poland with impunity, which would be impossibly shocking even within a Nazi-dominated Germany. Eichmann recalled the critical early days. On the 30th of October, Himmler published the following order. During the months of November and December, as well as January and February 1940, approximately one million Jews must be transported to the Polish areas captured in the east. From Western Poland, Jews were to be deported east. In these captured territories, the Jews had to be concentrated in areas where there would be good railway connections. The railway factor was essential, and Eichmann the expert who could solve all the problems. I was given the responsibility for transport and dispatching. Heydrich was the commander, and I was in charge of immigration and transports, according to the orders to clear the new eastern provinces of Germany. All this time, I was in the position of specialist. But where could the multitude of Jews go? Deportation, as in Vienna, could no longer be the solution. Eichmann came up with a grandiose idea. Eichmann's idea was to bring several thousand of them to an isolated, inhospitable area of Poland, close to the Russian forces. All it had was a railway connection. The name of the area, Nisko, south of the river San, near Lublin. Heydrich approved the idea, and Eichmann dreamed it might even become a small Jewish province with himself in command. Eichmann waited in person at the train station for the first Jews to transport into the Polish areas captured in the east. From western Poland, Jews were to be deported east. In these captured territories, the Jews had to be concentrated in areas where there would be good railway connections. The railway factor was essential, and Eichmann the expert who could solve all the problems. I was given the responsibility for transport and dispatching. Heydrich was the commander. And I was in charge of immigration and transports, according to the orders to clear the new eastern provinces of Germany. All this time, I was in the position of specialist. But where could the multitude of Jews go? Deportation, as in Vienna, could no longer be the solution. Eichmann came up with a grandiose idea. Eichmann's idea was to bring several thousand of them to an isolated, inhospitable area of Poland, close to the Russian forces. All it had was a railway connection. The name of the area, Nisko, south of the river San, near Lublin. Heydrich approved the idea, and Eichmann dreamed it might even become a small Jewish province with himself in command. Eichmann waited in person at the train station for the first Jews to arrive in Nisko. Among the hundreds who came that day was Ariel Alter from Czechoslovakia. Eichmann, like the people who came 
לקח לאיזה אפל, לספירה, ודיבר איתנו שאנחנו נהיה פה, במקום הזה יהיה פעם מדינה יהודית, שאנחנו הראשונים פה, ואנחנו צריכים לעבוד על דברים שיהיה פעם בשביל היהודים לטובה. Though more deportees came from Czechoslovakia, the badly planned project never got off the ground. But Nisko showed Heydrich's confidence in Eichmann. Nisko was a sideshow to the main event in Poland, the rebirth of the ghetto. Heydrich's orders to concentrate Jews in closed areas resurrected the practice of the hated medieval ghetto. One of the first ghettos to be set up in Poland was Lublin, close to Nisko. Eichmann visited it frequently. It was here that the Germans incarcerated the Jews of Lublin and the surrounding towns. The main idea was to enclose the Jews in one space and limit their movements to a few hours a day. The buildings of the ghetto still stand intact in one of the slum areas of the town. Although there are no more Jews living in Lublin, this area is still called the Jewish ghetto. Of the 120,000 inhabitants of Lublin, a third, 40,000, were Jews. This number increased when thousands more came to escape the Germans. When the German forces entered Lublin, they immediately forced the Jews who lived on the main street, Krakowskaya, to move out of their houses. The houses were confiscated and the Jews forbidden to leave the town. Jews to wear the Jewish star. A month later, all Polish Jews above the age of 10 were ordered to wear on their right sleeve a blue Jewish star at least 10 centimeters wide. Eichmann claims to be partly responsible for the use of the Jewish star. It may have been the propaganda ministry that first thought up the idea of forcing all Jews to wear a yellow star on their clothing. I naturally took part in the administrative details. The marking was intended to hinder assistance to the Jews who were being harassed. Eichmann's main role was the provision of transport to the ghettos. In his memoirs, he seems to liken the ghettos to a holiday camp. I would not say I originated the ghetto system. That would be to claim too great a distinction. The father of the system was an Orthodox Jew who wanted to remain by himself. The assimilated Jew was, of course, very unhappy about being moved to a ghetto. But the Orthodox were very pleased with the arrangements, as were the Zionists. The assimilated Jews found ghetto life degrading, and non-Jews may have seen an unpleasant element of force in it. But basically, most Jews feel well and happy in their ghetto life. Later came the sealing of Warsaw's ghetto, confining nearly half a million people into an area only a few kilometers wide. Many Jews were sent there from other European centers. 
conditions were appalling. Dozens to a room, no sanitation. The starving haunted the streets. Others died from raging epidemics. But Eichmann had his quotas and his schedules. Dr. Israel Gutman was a teenager in the Warsaw Ghetto and a member of the Jewish underground. Gutman? Dyer Gutman. We prepared a film, a documentary film. I prepared a film for, for 45 minutes or so to present to the board. Now, out of fairness to the, uh, to, the, to the defense, before we presented that in court, I wanted him and his lawyer to see that film. So we brought him into the courtroom and we showed him that film. And I wanted to, I mean, I knew the film, but I wanted to see how he reacted. It was completely impassive. The city of the living dead. Human beings reduced to worse degradation than the world has known, even in the darkest age. Sick and old persons and pregnant women went straight to the gas chamber. Everything at Auschwitz was done with hideous precision. Even the victim's shoes were heaped in storage sheds. Suddenly he spoke in a very excited manner to the warden. Yes, he said that he had been brought into the courtroom uh, with his, in his grey suit. And he had been promised that he would never be taken to the courtroom where other people were present without wearing his blue suit. And they shouldn't promise him a thing like that if they can't keep it, uh, keep, uh, keep to that, keep that promise. And he had to protest vehemently about being brought into the courtroom in, the, in his gray suit. That it was what troubled him, you know, when he saw the, 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 these frightful pictures about the death camps. That was the only thing that, that disturbed him. Der Führer reitet mit seinen Generälen die Front der Ehrenkompanie ab. As winter turned into spring in 1940, country after country fell before the German division. France, Norway, Belgium, Holland, Denmark. With each conquest, more and more Jews were coming under Nazi control and heading in Eichmann's direction. Eichmann's star was ascending. In 1941, he was made head of Section 4B4, the Jewish division of the Gestapo. In the same year, he was promoted to Obersturmbahnführer, Lieutenant Colonel. German troops swept into the Soviet Union. Behind them came the Einsatz out as assigned targets. Between spring 1941 and the autumn of the following year, the Einsatzgruppen shot nearly one and a half million Jews. Lamont Aliatakir, 
The memories of those days cover many pages of Eichmann's memoirs. In the fall of 1941, my superiors ordered me to go to Heydrich's office. He told me the Fuhrer has given orders for the physical destruction of the Jews. At first, I had to run the expression physical destruction through my mind in order to grasp its meaning. It was something unknown, new and unusual. Up to then, I had not heard this expression and had to digest it. <laughs> Eichmann was now ordered to travel to the east and survey the murders. He carried orders to Adilo Globochnik, police chief of Lublin, to continue with the killing of the Jews. Later he watched his first execution. The Jews, men, women and children, undressed before his eyes and walked to a big trench. I was impressed to see them all jumping into the pit without offering any resistance. Then the men of the squad banged away into the pit with their rifles and machine pistols. And there were children in the pit. I saw a woman hold up a child of a year or two, pleading. At that moment, all I wanted to say was, don't shoot, hand over the child. Then the child was hit. I was so close that later I found I had bits of brains spattered on my long leather coat. Why did the scene linger so long in my memory? Perhaps because I had children myself. On the trip back, I hardly spoke a word. I was thinking. Until now, I had thought there would be a political solution. Now that the Fuhrer has ordered a physical solution, a physical solution it must be. But we cannot go on conducting executions as they were done in Minsk and Lublin. Our men will become sadists. We cannot solve the Jewish problem by putting a bullet through the brain of a defenseless woman who's holding a child up to us. He described how he had to watch that and how the, the bodies were covered with sand and then blue geezers spurred it up. And he said, I almost fainted when I had to see that. All the physical part did not appeal to him. He didn't like to watch that. He was a typical sadist of the rivalry. He liked to play cat and mouse with some of the victims. We are with you. I have two dogs. I said, I have two dogs. We are not a ruby. Ah, that girl, Yes. 
צעיר, רזה, זוכר את הפרצוף שלו. הוא מסתכל עליי, הוא אומר לי, אתה זה וזה, אבל אצלי זה רשום שביום זה וזה ירו בך, הרגו אותך. על מי אתה עובד? הוא אומר, אתה לא עובד. מתחיל לשאול אותי על חיפה. In summer 1941, Heydrich started to prepare plans for the annihilation and murder of the entire Jewish population of Europe. The setting chosen for the unveiling of the design for genocide could not have been more ideal. A small luxury villa by Lake Vansi near Berlin, used by the SS for weekend retreats. Here in this tranquil spot on the 20th of January 1942, Heydrich assembled 15 of the Nazi top hierarchy, most vital to his scheme. The meeting was held in strict secrecy. Now they were approaching the real goal. Eichmann had been involved from the start and came as a representative of the Gestapo. He'd also sent out the invitations, adding, This is a meeting of extraordinary importance and we must achieve a common view. Eichmann organized the Monday conference together with Heydrich and they decided that the time had come to inform all the various functionaries uh, and the director generals of the various ministries of the final solution that all the idea was to kill all Jews. And they, well, there was some trepidation before. They were fearful, Heydrich and Eichmann. That, I mean, some of these people were lawyers, some of these German officials in the various ministries, and they thought there might be some objection to this criminal scheme of murdering, of killing uh, millions of people. After a brief dinner, Heydrich read a speech which had been drafted by Eichmann. In it, he expressed praise for the Einsatzgruppen killings in Russia. But those had been stopgap solutions. Now the Nazis would systematically and methodically plan the murder of every Jew in Europe. The protocol coolly laid out the number of Jews to be seized in each country. Over two million in the eastern territories of Poland. 330,000 in England. 4,000 Jews in Ireland and 5 million in the Soviet Union. Total, 11 million Jews. Now to the crux of the matter, did anybody object? And then the evening came and there was no objection to the whole idea of the final solution in this sinister sense. So after the people had left, Eichmann and Heydrich set before a, 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 a log fire uh, uh, and uh, drank brandy. That's, I mean, that's what Eichmann said, because they were so delighted that everything had, had gone off so smoothly. The mood was ecstatic. Because of the seclusion of the villa, everyone felt free to talk openly and enthusiastically about killing and annihilation. At his trial, Eichmann tried to distance himself from the euphoria, but admitted Van Say was about murder. Deception and preparation for murder. These were the underlying pillars of Vansay. The policy of secrecy and deception was also used in regard to Theresienstadt ghetto, which is administered by Eichmann's office. Heydrich asked me how we could clean Bohemia of the Jews. I said we must put aside a city with a lot of reserved land at the disposal of the problem. Thus, the city of Theresen was emptied of its civilians. 
In addition, Himmler gave orders for Theresienstadt to be transformed into a model ghetto to show foreigners. inhabitants of the small Czech town were evacuated from their houses in order to make space for the expected flood of Jewish deportees. Netrovian was then 11 years old. The cellar of his house was turned into a synagogue. Eichmann invited journalists and foreign groups to visit in order to cover up the murder of European Jews. Life in Theresienstadt was supposed to be an example of what was happening in the rest of the camps. The few letters which were sent from Theresienstadt praised the camp, but the reality was very different. During 1942, 16,000 died from disease and hunger. Here, illusion and pretense became a way of life. As part of the deception masking the real horrors, Himmler ordered a propaganda film to be made that showed a town of smiling harmony. Red Cross delegations were brought to a place that Eichmann might have called his Potemkin village. When they arrived, the whole ghetto would be turned upside down. Eichmann היה אחראי על זה של הביקורת של צלב האדום בזמנו שהגיע לטרזינשטדט ואנחנו כולנו עמדנו ושפשפנו את הבתים ואת הרחובות כדי שהצלב האדום יחשוב שהולך לנו כל כך טוב שפתקו פתאום גני ילדים וחילקו פרוסות לחם עם, עם חמאה Miro Shlav Kani saw Eichmann in Theresienstadt during one of these Red Cross visits. The skutečnost je tam byl Eichmann, zástupci německého červeného kříže. A to byla taková jako prohlídka, která měla jako uklidnit, prostě posloužitý propagandě. Oběd byl dva dny předtím dobrý a dva dny potom už ne tedy, ale the Red Cross officials were shown football tournaments, were taken through the library, and they witnessed concerts. Once the Red Cross officials left, reality took over. At the end of the filming, all the crew and participants were sent to be killed in the East. Previously, Eichmann had been the expert in charge of forced emigration. Now, he would be the expert roundup man. Eichmann's assistants, who had been with him for years, like Dieter Wieslitzeni, Theodor Danica, and Alois Brunner, would now fan out all over Europe. A massive job of coordination now devolved on Eichmann. His task was twofold. Organize and collect the Jews, then transport them to death. The transport ministry had to be contacted, timetables consulted, collection points defined, trains allocated. <laughs> שאותו אדולף אייכמן עומד לבקר בגטו. Almost half a century after he gave witness at the Eichmann trial, Zeev Sapir still recalls very vividly 
his journey to Auschwitz, recalls how Eichmann personally saw him and his family going on the journey of death from which his parents never returned. Da war Jung und Fia Adolf Eichmann. Wir rein also in der Rahabak, da war das, in der Wusch, der Mann bei SS, der Rufkin, der in Eto. שאלה <אח> 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 <אח>
נלמד שם מרופא ורב בתנועת יד קטנה או ימינה או שמאלה הוריי הלכו ימינה לא הספקתי להתפרד אני הלכתי שמאלה נפתחה דלת וראינו גופות ראיתי גופות ככה גופות אחת לשנייה והגופות היו צמודות זו לזו ותתחיל לקום ככה הגופות האלה לא מוציאים, זה כבר לבורות, היו שם בורות, אש, הבורות האלה גם צפו שם גופות. Besides sending Jews to the camps, Eichmann's office issued instructions on the fate of the prisoners and kept records of the annihilation. It was quite logical then for Eichmann to visit Auschwitz to see for himself that everything was running smoothly. In the spring of 1942, I received orders to go to Auschwitz and report on the means that the concentration camp commander was using on the Jews. Hess, the commandant of Auschwitz, explained to me that he was using cyanide for the killing. The gas was thrown in pellets into the cells in which the Jews were concentrated. Eichmann saw the killings but never felt responsible. He cared only about details, not the overall picture. What happened exactly or was going to happen with the transport from such and such, whether the people being transported were going to be killed or whether they would remain in a concentration camp, none of the involved authorities knew any details. Similarly, I never knew anything myself. By September 1942, the war was completing its third year. Meanwhile, executing the final solution proceeded at an ever-increasing pace. Now, Eichmann concentrated on the big transportations from Western Europe. In every European country under our jurisdiction, it was the job of the representative in my office to work through local officials until he had obtained our goal, a roundup of the Jews and their delivery to the transports. I carefully set up my timetables and the trains were rolling. But through the years, we met many difficulties. Eichmann thought France would provide few problems. He was wrong. On Eichmann's orders, thousands of Jews were rounded up. The first destination of the deportees was Dransi Detention Camp, under the command of Eichmann's assistant, Alois Brunner. Cautious of French public opinion, Eichmann's plans moved slowly but remorselessly. The first train left France for Auschwitz in March 1942. At one point, Eichmann was asked to decide the fate of 4,000 children. His answer was decisive. Children's transports can now get underway. Their destination, the death camps. In his memoirs, Eichmann wrote, at this time, I myself had three little children. I don't want to say any more at this time. Last commander of the Auschwitz uh, death camp, Rudolf Hess, he wrote amongst that sometimes they had to kill a thousand children a day. And the children used to kneel down sometimes and ask to be saved. And when he had to push the children into the gas chambers, his knees were getting a bit wobbly sometimes. And then he adds, but I always felt ashamed afterwards of this weakness of mine after I talked to Obersturmbannführer Adolf Eichmann because Eichmann explained to me 
and it's especially the children who have to be killed first because he thinks this new re-emergence of that race has to be prevented. In summer, Eichmann aimed to move another 100,000, but the French officials would not cooperate. When a train arrived at Auschwitz, half empty, Eichmann raised a scandal and threatened the French that he would not clean France of its Jews. Angered at the difficulty of the deportations, Eichmann made frequent visits to Paris. The pace was too slow, the numbers too few for Eichmann. Talking of this to Sasson, he referred to himself as the master. Even when the master comes only twice a year, he has told all kinds of stories. The difficulties are blown out of proportion. In the end, one has to be grateful if one gets crumbs instead of the whole loaf. We managed after a struggle to get the deportations going. Train loads of Jews were soon leaving France. Whether they were bank directors or mental cases, the people who were loaded on these trains meant nothing to me. It was really none of my business. Dr. Joseph Melkman, born in Amsterdam, was present at a meeting of Jewish leaders when Eichmann brought in a Jew who'd worked with him in Prague. His purpose was to instruct the Dutch Jews in the Eichmann system. In Holland, the battle for the Jews was especially hard and bitter. The Dutch, for one thing, don't make a distinction between Dutchmen and Jews with Dutch citizenship. The person was either Dutch, they said, or he wasn't. The Dutch Jews felt safe. For hundreds of years, they'd enjoyed complete freedom and economic prosperity. Early in the occupation, the attempted arrest of 400 Jews in Amsterdam set off a general protest strike involving streetcars, factories, shops and shipyards. When thousands of Jews went into hiding, Eichmann offered special rewards for informers. For Eichmann, the individual mattered as much as the mass. As far as he was concerned, no one would escape his net. When the Dutch government attempted to exempt a few Jewish diamond experts from deportation, Eichmann wrote to headquarters, At this advanced stage, it is preposterous to let other agencies deal with police and security affairs. When the German foreign ministry tried to save a few individual Jews for special reasons, Eichmann's reply was that for reasons of principle, the request could not be granted. Some Jews escaped, but many were shipped off to the death camps via Westerbrook. Ironically, in Holland, which had been so good to the Jews, the proportion of Jews killed in the Holocaust was to be the greatest in Europe. From over 110,000 sent to the camps, only 5,000 remained alive at the end of the war. The reasons? The dedication and passion of Eichmann's helpers. <laughs> Eichmann, Darash, Abba, Im Elef, Judin, 
לגרש מהולנד, והם רצו להגיע ליותר מ-50 אלף עד סוף השנה. וארקיין גם, איכמן אמר שבהולנד לא הייתה לו בעיות, וארקיין ברכבות נסעו, זה היה יוצא מן הכלל. Eichmann may have begun to feel he was racing against time. In Stalingrad, in bitter winds and heavy snows, the Germans attacked again and again, only to be driven back with heavy losses. It was clear to Eichmann his work had to be speeded up. He traveled to Warsaw to take matters in hand. By the start of 1943, Eichmann had already sent 400,000 Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto to the death camps. 50,000 still remained in the ghetto. Weekly, there were transports from the Umschlag plants opposite the Gestapo headquarters to Treblinka death camp. Suspecting a final deportation, the ghetto rose in rebellion in mid-April. This marked the beginning of the uprising of the Warsaw Ghetto. In Berlin, Hitler's birthday, April the 19th, was being celebrated by concerts and other festivities. A rebellion on Hitler's birthday could not be tolerated. Congratulations were showered on Hitler in the capital, German forces entered the Warsaw Ghetto. They were met with fierce resistance. Fighting raged from house to house and from street to street. After three weeks of continuous fighting, the Germans set the ghetto on fire. As the flames spread, the underground fighters jumped from the buildings or fled to the sewers. By June, all was quiet. The Germans had lost over a thousand troops. Eichmann was sent to inspect the damage. I was shown the nest of resistance that had only been taken by concentrated charges. It was a hard fight. I seldom saw a place so destroyed as Warsaw. The uprising in the ghetto taught us a bitter lesson about putting an excessive number of people into these enclosures.
At the beginning of 1944, 800,000 Jews were living in Hungary in comparative calm, half in Budapest. Eichmann was now sent in person to deal with the Jews of Hungary, the last remaining untouched Jewish community in Europe. He told Sasson in Argentina, After years of working behind a desk, I had come out into the reality of the field. As my boss put it, they sent me, the master himself, to make sure the Jews didn't revolt as they had in the Warsaw Ghetto. Eichmann had recruited a special force called the Eichmann Commando, which now followed the German divisions into Hungary. Eichmann immediately set up headquarters at the Hotel Majestic overlooking Budapest. Eichmann wasted no time with his preparations. The deportations started in May. By July, over 400,000 Jews a staggering half of Hungary's Jewish population, mostly from outside Budapest, had been sent to their death. In Auschwitz, Rudolf Hess, the commander of the camp, complained that the numbers were overwhelming him. Eichmann wrote, Hess told me he could not understand why I showed absolutely no consideration for him and his staff. But how could I? Having worked so fast and efficiently, Eichmann now found that he had plenty of time on his hands. In his prison writings, Eichmann suddenly opens a window onto his off-duty life. People would find it hard to believe me if I said that during those last years, I never had so much leisure time and less to do than those months I spent in Budapest. In my private life, I was involved with motorsports and sailboating. I also had many personal friends and a horse for riding. The former oil salesman from Linz now had the most elegant of cars, a number of mistresses, and all the joys of a great city. Eichmann was living the good life. He dined well, drank extensively, and enjoyed the comforts of his villa and surrounds on Rose Hill. Zev Kanarek, a Jew, cooked daily for Eichmann in Budapest. He had blonde hair and the fake identity papers of an ordinary Hungarian. He was present when Eichmann killed a boy in the Hotel Majestic. Hotel Majestic Zayasha Yehudi, Agronom Mefusam, Kol Haperot, Segodim de Hungaria Hayal. Amrula Anusha Yespo Pri, Aparsekim de Tapuchim, Seze Rotim Bishloch Matana. is a bull head, the notem maka ala gap shala yelet. Nachnu lo yedam she biglal maze, a yelet nafal, the kibel maka mi madrega rishona, madrega shniya, po, brosh, niftach lo amoch, ve ala makom me. Afar sekim hayu yerukim, yef shara yale cholot, lo yash shara shum dabar.
While Eichmann played in Budapest, the German war effort was gradually faltering. The Allies had landed at Normandy and were advancing across France. On the eastern borders, the Russians were increasing the pressure. During the final stages of the war, when the German generals on the eastern front were clamoring for reinforcements and for ammunition, he by trickery managed to get priority for his death trains, although he knew he was actually sabotaging Germany's war effort. And he told some of his friends, he said, I know the war is lost, but I'm still going to win my war. When the railways were bombed, Eichmann decided to dispatch the Jews by foot. I wanted to show the Allies my hand, as it were, to tell them, you smashed our transportation routes. But we... 7,000 collapsed from fatigue and were shot. And 1,000 died from hunger. Eichmann's remaining plans were frustrated by the swift advance of the Soviet army on Budapest. With his world collapsing around him, Eichmann quickly departed the capital. I left Budapest at 3 p.m. on Christmas Eve. As my Mercedes raced westward, the road was already under Russian artillery fire. A great flood of refugees streaming towards Vienna had choked the highway. Now, it was suddenly empty. It was as if the road had died. When Eichmann returned to Berlin, he found a city in ruins and his status changed. In Eichmann's own building, people were beginning to avoid him. Already, there was a feeling in the air that Eichmann would be singled out when surrender came. In the eyes of his comrades, he was turning into a leper. Though denying all guilt, Eichmann started destroying evidence of his actions. On his instructions, most of his archives went up in flames. In Berlin, those who had cheered yesterday for Hitler were now burning his picture. The good times were over. The Eichmann went into hiding. Finally, the war was over. The plague and pestilence that had afflicted the world for 12 years was silenced and stilled. But as millions rejoiced, others started counting the cost. More than 55 million had died, mostly civilians. And nearly 6 million Jews had died. In the cities and the ghettos, in the forests, in the gas chambers, and in the camps. And above all, in Auschwitz. These were the bitter fruits of Eichmann's work, and Eichmann was still alive and hunted. memoirs, Eichmann pictures himself as a praised hero right to the end. My immediate superior, General Mueller, said to me, if we had 50 Eichmanns, we could have won the war. When I realized the necessity for a final solution, I carried it through with all the fanaticism that an old Nazi would expect of himself, and that my superiors undoubtedly expected of me. They found me to be the right man in the right place.
Eichmann did not admit guilt. Even in the shadow of the gallows, there was no remorse. Jawohl, weil ich einen Aufruf als das Schlimmste, ähm, Verbrechen und Vergehen äh, betrachte, dessen sich ein Mensch überhaupt würdig werden kann. Das ist ein Nein, das natürlich nicht, aber damit habe ich, bin ich ja nicht befasst worden. Ich bin mit der Vernichtung nicht beschäftigt gewesen. Wäre ich mit der Vernichtung beauftragt worden, dann würde ich mich wahrscheinlich erschossen haben in jeder Zeit. Denke ich. This was the ever repeated line of his defense and the spirit of his prison memoirs. But Eichmann's own summary of his life when he was still free was different. I worked relentlessly to kindle the fire. I was not just the recipient of orders. Had I been that, I would have been an imbecile. I was an idealist. During the final sessions of his trial, Eichmann was confronted with the memoirs he dictated to Sassen in Argentina. It was only then, for the first time, that he expressed any contrition, hoping perhaps to escape the hangman. When he wrote his uh, sort of uh, uh, his memories, there, of course, he tried consistently to say, "I was a, a, a minor officer. I was a small cog in the machine. I had to carry out orders." I never liked the, 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 the killing of, of Jews, but I had, had no choice. On the other hand, when he spoke to Sassen, he, uh, I, I imagine, said what he really felt. And amongst other things, Sassen asked him, tell me, Mr. Eichmann, do you ever feel sorry for what you have done? And he said, yes, I, felt, I feel sorry for one thing, that I wasn't hard enough, that I wasn't tough enough, that I didn't fight these damn interventionists enough. Now you see the result, the creation of the state of Israel and the re-emergence of that race there. After 14 weeks of argument and months of deliberation, Eichmann was sentenced to death on December the 11th, 1961. During the months awaiting his appeal, Eichmann finally wrote his prison memoirs, hoping to improve his image. His appeal to the Supreme Court was rejected, and on the 31st of May 1962, he was told that the Israeli president had turned down his wife's plea for clemency. Eichmann asked for a bottle of red wine, but refused efforts to reconcile him to religion. When he was brought to the execution chamber, there was still no remorse, and he refused to be blindfolded. Eichmann's last words were, I had to obey the rules of war and my flag. Eichmann was hung at midnight on the 31st of May in Ramla jail. Early in the morning, his body was cremated and his ashes scattered at sea. It was 25 years since Eichmann had first travelled the same waters looking for a final solution.